Hello everybody. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday, otherwise known as Fact Friday. So I hope you're all doing marvelously well. Of course, you can hit the like button if you like the video. You can also subscribe, and once you subscribe, there's a little bell that comes up, and if you hit the bell, it will notify you that we're doing another video. We do about five videos a week, pretty much every single week. Uh, we do giveaways and reviews and interviews with famous and incredible people, and not so famous, but definitely incredible people as well. We like to really balance this out. And of course, we do mixing tips and tricks and this, which is Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. What is an acceptable amount of bleed in drum mics? And what is the best way to get the least bleed? The rather wonderful Dave Jordan, who um, obviously is a really well-known producer, but also most importantly, I believe, started off as an engineer and engineered some of the best sounding records of all time, such as Remain in Light by the Talking Heads. And of course, the rather wonderful My Life, A Bush of Ghosts by um, David Byrne and Brian Eno, and probably most famously with, of course, Michael Beinhorn, Herbie Hancock's Rocket, Future Shock. What an amazing album. He told me the rule he learned was when a drummer plays, say, the rack tom, no other mic that is not the rack tom mic should pick up more than a 9 dB worth of signal. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't make a lot of sense in our digital world, at least not like it used to. So what he would do is he would look at the VU meters, and if they went up more than 9 dB, he would move the microphone, find a place where they were picking up less. But it was always a compromise between picking up the drum itself, you know, whether it be a rack, tom, snare, floor, cymbals, whatever it is, you know, picking up that without picking too much bleed from other things. So. I believe in this wonderful world of digital, we can get away with a lot more. The most important thing that you should be doing is getting the instrument to sound the best. Now, with a snare drum, quite often that's pulling the mic back a bit. Because the more you pull it back, the more kind of overall sound and body you get of the snare. However, if you pull it back too far and the drummer has the hi-hat really super low, you're gonna get a lot of hi-hat bleed. It might be because the 57 or whatever dynamic you're using, or even you know small diaphragm condenser, you will get the rejection behind it, but you're still gonna get an extra amount of bleed. So, what's the first thing you do? You encourage, with loving support, you encourage your drummer to move the hi-hat up. And I can tell you, when you're working with really, really great seasoned professional drummers, they will have the snare here and have the hi-hat at least here. When you first start off, everybody wants the drum super close. They'll put the hi-hat right next to the snare and the tom's like flat and everything's like, like this so they don't have to move very much. But when you get a Victor and Drizzo in or a, a Blair Center or a Vinnie, any one of those guys, it's here. It's like hat and snare and there's great separation because they've worked with so many incredible engineers and producers over the years that they have encouraged them to spread their kit out a little bit, to have space. For instance, the next thing, ride cymbal sitting over a floor tom. How many times have you seen the ride cymbal literally like an inch away from touching the skin? Because the drummer just wants to kind of do this and casually play the ride and then be able to do the floor. Problem is, as I'm sure you're very aware, with all of these things, you hit a cymbal, then a tom, if they're all very, very close, they will just bleed into the drum mic. So, what's the best way to reduce the bleed? Encourage those cymbals to go a little higher. If you can get those cymbals, you know, an extra few inches above the toms, like maybe a foot minimum away from it, that's a good start. The ride should be at least a foot. If you can get it like 18 inches above, if you can get it up there, then great. If you can do the same with the cymbals and get them really a long way above the snare drum, better still. You'll really get better separation. You'll frankly have a lot more control with that in the mix and you won't be facing as many bleed problems. The second thing for us as engineers, of course, is to move the mics where they have the most amount of rejection, which means quite often I will have a mic coming in 
So if my ride symbol's here, hopefully this makes sense. So say my ride symbol is here. I'll have the mic coming in underneath it. So the null point, the dead point behind the mic is actually facing the symbol. I won't put it here because if I come in on the side, that is not the dead point. It's not the null point, if you like. Dead is easier to understand. So basically, if that symbol's flapping around here, it's going to come into the side of the microphone. So first thing you're going to try and do is come in underneath the symbol with the symbol being high enough above. So if the, if the mic is pointing down like this at an angle, the whole back side of it, which is not hearing barely anything, is where the symbol lives. It's logical and also test it. You know, if you've got time on, an, on a session, get the assistant, get the drummer, or you obviously don't want to wear the drummer out, but get somebody to sit there and like play the ride cymbal and play the tom, but, and just see how much bleed you're getting in there. Find that place where you still like the sound of the tom, but you get the least amount of bleed. And after you've been doing this for a few years, you will end up with the mic in the best position pretty much by eye almost every time. People say to me, you know, how do you, how do you mic so quickly? In fact, it's been said so many times, how do you mic it so quickly? It's because I've done it so many times, I know where the drum sounds the best from being hit once or twice and where I'm gonna get the best rejection. It's always a balance between those two. However, there's gonna be plenty of times when the drummer is not going to want to raise their cymbals. You know, and if you've got an older seasoned musician and they won't do it, they haven't done it by the age of 40, they may never do it. That's just kind of life, the universe and everything and you have to deal. So that's where you do have to get creative. And luckily, with the wonderful world of uh, DAWs, we can now get in there and reduce that somewhat. There's so many great tools, plus just obvious things where you can EQ the end of a tom hit or something, just take out the high end and put a crossfade in so it's like doom. So as it decays, the high end, high end is like wiped off slightly. Plus there's also great plugins out there that do that, that can actually remove that stuff as well. But ultimately, like anything, you want to start with recording it the best possible way you can and use tricks afterwards, not as a last resort, but as a last resort. <laughs> I mean, you know, you want to get those down as best as you can. So, quick recap. Try to get the cymbals as high over the drums as possible. Secondly, get those mics so that behind the capsule, the area directly behind the capsule is where the cymbals are and you'll get the best rejection. Those are the two most important things because really ultimately, ultimately when it comes to drums, we're talking about cymbal bleed into close mics on drums. Next thing I will say while we're talking about it is um, room mics. Quite often, in fact, almost all the time, I will high mic, but I'll also low mic. I'll put mics low down, sometimes reflected off the floor, occasionally directed at the kit. The reason for this is I'm trying to get less of the cymbals. When, it, when I'm coming up over high, of course, I'm going to get a lot of sploshiness from the cymbals. They're going to be the thing that the microphones first hear. So, a couple of things. In mixing, you can use some light saturation and that high end will disappear first. That's something we talked about with uh, Jakia King using the lo-fi plugin. And I asked him about that and he does. And if you're on Produce Like a Pro Academy, you can go back and watch that video with Jakia where he shows you how he did it. But anyway, lo-fi is great. Any kind of saturation will get rid of that high end. However, of course, the, the best thing for that is to encourage your drummer to play the drums more evenly. You want big kick, big snare, defined proper toms, hit really definitively. And then cymbals played within the scope of the kit. So it's like kick, snare, kick, kick, snare, cymbal. Not kick, snare, kick, kick, snare, cymbal, which is unfortunately a lot of drummers. You just end up with this wash of cymbals probably because they're playing far too loud, the band's cranking around them. So to even hear those cymbals, their ears have turned the high, high mids down, so they're playing them far too hard, which is another reason for giving a drummer a really good headphone mix so they know how to play balance, make sure they've got a really good headphone mix. Other thing you can do while we're talking about it is get a little bit, I'm looking around, a bit of like kitchen towel, paper towel, if you like. In England and the UK, we call it kitchen towel, but I think over in America, it's paper towel. You get a little square of paper towel, put it under the symbol, and just a little bit of tape. 
It is a great trick used by every credible engineer I've ever met. We all do it. And it's a great way just to take a little bit of edge and a little bit of sustain off of the cymbal. It doesn't like dampen it down 100%, 10%, it's probably about five or 10%, but that little piece can help. You might put a little piece on the edge, a little piece more on the near the bell, and piece on another edge, and you'll notice it'll go from ch to like ch. It'll just decay a little shorter, meaning there's less bleed in there, and it will just dull it down. The other thing as well is like listen to the symbols they have. If they only have super thin, super bright symbols, then you're going to have to try all kinds of things. But if they do happen to have some vintage Zildjian's or some A's, you know, some custom A's, things that are a little darker and thicker, then great. But just go through, see if they've got a selection, try them out, see what sounds works with the kit, see what works really well and balanced in there, and, you know, dull them down if you have to. But ultimately, those are all the tricks, but the best trick of all is to get your drummer to raise the cymbals, so you have better separation between cymbals and toms, and cymbals and um, hi-hat and snare, and then encourage them to play more evenly. That is the best solution. Even play drums with great separation, and then you're gonna have a blast mixing it. That's the number one thing. All the rest of it's just icing on the cake. So a couple of weeks ago, we told you about Storyblocks. It's a great company where you can get music that is royalty free. And also video that is royalty free. So this little section is sponsored by our friends over at Storyblocks Audio. Storyblocks Audio is a great service for when you're in need of a quick soundbite for any project. Get unlimited downloads from studio quality audio clips. We actually used one a couple of weeks ago, so I can vouch for it. You can get loops, you can get music tracks and sound effects with a membership to the Storyblocks Audio. All the content is royalty free, so you can use it for commercial and personal projects such as YouTube videos. New clips are added regularly, so there's always something fresh to download. I have to tell you, we did use it a couple of weeks ago in the TGU recap. So at the end of that video, the music that was playing out with all of the credits and everything, of because of the TGU, the tone people were so wonderful, we had to name check them because they're such lovely people and they made every, every YouTuber and everybody that went there so welcome. So we had this credits that ran for a couple of minutes and the music was really cool and I actually didn't know Eric had used it from there. Afterwards I was like, oh, this is cool, where'd you get it from? And he goes, I got it from Storyblocks Audio. So I can 100% vouch for it because I've used it. There's so many times when I want something different. A lot of the songs that I've got that we use in our tutorials, I've produced and engineered and co-written, but sometimes I need something outside of that. So it was really great that we get to use this service. We're users, that's why we're recommending it. So please click the link in the description underneath here. So if you go to underneath the video, there will be a description that you can click and you can go and check out Storyblocks Audio. Is a matched pair of, say, something like U87 so different from two separately bought ones? Or couldn't I just use two of them? Hmm, how exacting do you want to be? Um, I have, actually I have two pairs of matched U87s, don't I? I have a pair sitting over there, and I have a pair at Harmony, so we have two pairs of matched U87s. Um, I don't use them as often as I used to. So this is, there's a lot to talk about here. I don't use them as often as I used to because when I do want something that's perfectly matched, I frankly use a pair of Lewitts. Or if I need something that's stereo and it's absolutely perfectly stereo, we use the Lewitt 640 TS because it's a dual diaphragm microphone. So basically what it is on each side of the capsule, it hears left and right side. And the way they designed it originally, the 640TS, is so they could change the polar pattern. It's an ingenious design they put out a few years ago, which I hear lots of people are now doing. But they were the first to do it, and I still think they sound the best. So what you can do is you can then change the polar pattern after recording, which is really, really good when you're mixing and you're trying to maybe get some room tone on an electric guitar or room tone you know, on, a, on a, um, drums or whatever, and then you want to tighten it. You can make it hypercardioid, you know, hyper super cardioid, you know, uh, figure of eight omni, you name it. So it's a really, really smart idea. However, the other great thing about having this capsule where you can hear two sides is you can take a left and a right, and you guessed it, it's the best stereo sound you've ever heard. So 
I believe it's about seven or eight hundred bucks. I love U87s. I have two pairs of matched ones. I don't use them that often anymore. And the last time I looked, they were slightly shy of three thousand dollars each. So even if they round them down to twenty five hundred or twenty six, we're talking about fifty five, you know, five or six thousand dollars worth of microphones. So it's getting beaten every day by that. So. If you're really asking about a pair of U87s and you're wondering whether you should buy a second one, I wouldn't. I would just take the two or $3,000 that you're about to spend on, a, on another U87 and just buy that mic for your stereo applications. Now, if you are genuinely talking about, because I know there's lots of qu potential questions here. If you're genuinely talking about having, maybe buying a mic, it doesn't have to be an 87, but just like a large diaphragm condenser and then buying a second one two years later. Do I think it'd be matched enough? Yes, it'll be matched enough. Um, I really do. It, it, once you get into a certain range, price range, they're not going to be perfect, but probably close enough. Now, that could start World War III down there with people disagreeing with me, and that's perfectly okay. But I have made lots and lots of albums, and so have other people made lots and lots of albums where we've used a pair of U47s or a pair of U67s, or sometimes three U67s above a drum kit, a pair of 47s or 67s on a piano. And I can, I schnizzle you not, if you were to put those microphones in a situation where they were recording the same source, they would sound completely different. Once you get microphones, high quality tube microphones from 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, no matter how well maintained they are, how clean the capsule is, how fantastic the tubes are, whether they've all got the, the perfect right tube in it, they never ever sound the same. I've shot out 10 U47s and they all completely sounded different. It's like when you get people going, I built a clone of a U47. It's a, it's a joke amongst every professional. There is no one sound of a 47. There's an amazing one, a Blackbird, which uh, George Massenburg says is the best one he's ever heard. And it sounds beautiful. Mine sounds beautiful. I love mine, but it doesn't sound like that one. And I also have a U48, which is essentially the same uh, microphone, except it's got a figure of eight pattern. And that doesn't sound like my U47 or his U47 or their U47. You get the point. So yes, if you're going and getting a decent quality microphone and you want to buy a second one for stereo applications, then you're probably going to be okay in 99.9% .9 of the time. But if you really, really want accurate stereo reproduction and it's stereo you're after, just buy the 640TS. Hands down, my favorite investment ever. It is one of the best mics on the market. It's very affordable for what it does, and it gives you perfect stereo. We did it over a piano in Blackbird, and strangely enough, we put a pair of 87s on there, and we put the 640TS in the middle. And I have talked about this, this is probably the third time, so I apologize, but we went into the room, and we played back both, and we were all, all of us, all the students, dumbfounded just how good the 640TS sounded. It basically sounded, this is how it sounded, like this, with my head, over the piano, listening to the piano player playing. The 87 sounded wonderful, but it didn't sound exactly like the piano. And I think in the world that we live in with microphones now, I think there's a really, really positive move with companies like Lewitt and others, companies to produce microphones that are very, very, well, very is a very weak word extremely accurate. That are, so now, with the wonderful world of DAWs, where you have so many infinite possibilities, with plugins where you want to distort it, you want to make it sound like it's on tape, you want to make it sound like it's gone through tubes, you want to make it sound like it's gone through transformers, all of this incredible technology, which costs a fraction of the cost of all of this gear around me, but can get amazing results in the mix. What do you need? You need a microphone that gives you an exact representation. You don't need to go out and spend $15,000, as much as it's nice to have a $15,000 mic, if you can accurately get that vocal and capture it so amazingly, you can morph it afterwards. And this is a wonderful world and it's really opened up infinite possibilities. Because now I can mix, I can go, well, do I want to make it a little bit more dirty, overdriven, more like an RCA, like just take off some of the high end and do it, yeah. I can do that. Do I want to keep it super clean? Do I want to have a completely different sound in the verse and the chorus without changing the microphone? 
It's a great world. We live in a wonderful world and congratulations to all these great microphone companies. But to answer your question, if you want stereo, that's what I would do, I'd just buy that one microphone and save yourself a couple of thousand dollars. But if you are seriously thinking about getting a second 87, yeah, you'll be fine. The matched ones aren't actually matched. There's a whole forum thread on that, but they're close enough and they do sound good. Um, but I don't know if I would buy them all over again. I don't know if I would. We're finding ourselves using the 640TS on a piano now, so it's changed our whole view of recording. All right, that was a long one, sorry about that. When miking overheads and you want to do the equilateral triangle, how precisely do you measure the distance between the mics and the snare from one mic to another? Is it a ballpark or do you go down to the millimeter? Yes and no. Um, yes, that I will always measure from the center of the snare to the overheads and I get good coverage. I'll have the one from a drummer's perspective where I'm looking out here, I'll have the one um, over the ride and the floor tom low, and I'll have the one over the hi-hat and the snare high. So they end up being exactly the same distance away. Now, that equilateral triangle sometimes isn't quite as perfect here as it should be, but it's always perfect to the snare. It's mainly because I find that the most important thing. But yes, if you wanna get that triangle really, really accurate, it's always accurate to the center for the, the phase of the snare, and I would say it's usually accurate between it. And the reason why I'm sounding a little slightly vague is because I've read so much stuff with Glenn Johns about his three mic technique, where he said he always put it in visually and never measured it. And if you see photos of his setup, not that there's many, but you, they, they all look slightly different. And, and I've read interviews and I've seen people comment about it, and he said he always did it visually. So, and it's probably likely that after doing it a thousand times, he could position it pretty much in phase and then he would move it in phase. But yes, I think if you want something pretty perfect, you've got that low mic over the ride, measured say in inches, for instance, let's go 46 and a half inches to the center. And then you've got one above the snare and the hi-hat, which is also 46 and a half. And then the distance between the two should be around 46 and a half. So you'll get the triangle. And if you do get that equilateral triangle, you will get ultimate phase. But there are many, many times where you can't do that. I've been in situations where this is as high as the drum room ceiling will go, and so I have to spot mic cymbals. I know that sounds crazy, slightly over six feet, you know what I mean? There's all kinds of things that might stop you from doing something that's perfect. But I always get the overheads to be in phase with the snare, equal distance from the center of the snare. Okay, thanks everybody for watching, I really appreciate it. Please leave any comments and questions below. Don't forget to check out producelikeapro.com. Thank you ever so much for Storyblocks Audio for sponsoring this video. That was very kind of you. Don't forget to check out the link below. The best thing I can tell you about Storyblocks Audio is we do actually use it, and you're going to hear a lot more of it on our videos as well. All right, have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Don't forget to produce, go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, get a whole bunch of free goodies, and have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Mm -hmm.